Hello and welcome to this week's, this month's FDTD GOES Applications webinar. We're very happy today to have Derek Snyder from the Forecast Office in Paducah talking about how their office has incorporated GOES products into some warning decisions um, related to hydrology. Next slide, please. This is a part of a series of um, webinars on applications of GOES data led by forecasters. If you have a topic you think would be interesting, please contact either myself, Scott Lindstrom, or Dan Bikos. The, uh, we have NOAA.gov accounts. Next slide, please. And uh, just some protocol. Uh, Derek will talk for about 20 minutes, then we'll have some Q&A. Don't press hold, uh, mute yourself when you're not speaking, um, and take it away, Derek. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Scott. Um, like, uh, my name is Derek Snyder, and I'm a forecaster here at WFO Paducah, and I feel like this is a very uh, appropriate talk, given the uh, weather conditions across a lot of the country today in the, in the mid-Atlantic, and even here at Paducah, I'll probably be issuing some flash flood warnings uh, once I get done with this talk uh, on my evening shift. So um, I just thought I would, I wanted to kind of walk through a little bit, almost like I'm a little bit of a day in the life of how our office and how some of our forecast staff here have started incorporating some various GOES applications into the hydrologic warning uh, process, especially for short fuse warnings. So uh, I'll just kind of go through, a, I'll start with a bit of a brief overview uh, of a day. This was uh, not too long ago, it was only uh, on July 1st. And this is a, a kind of an environment that uh, you see a lot, uh, you know, we're in the lower Ohio Valley. Um, especially in, once you get into the summertime, you get these sort of very, uh, very unstable, very uh, days with a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, but not a lot of in the way of dynamics to support the convection. Um, and this is uh, pretty typical for a large part of the country, especially in the summertime. So I thought I'd just start with the 18Z surface analysis from July 1st. And what you see, and, and I'll just kind of highlight our region here, we're in far western Kentucky where the Ohio and Mississippi rivers come together. And we kind of have this area of uh, convection going ongoing over the mid-Missouri mid Valley, kind of associated with the stationary boundary. And then you have kind of convection propagating along this outflow boundary that had been uh, kind of continuing that started late uh, the night before and was kind of uh, working its way south and east uh, from the central plains. And uh, so the environment is pretty typical from what we see around here uh, in midsummer. So this is the 12Z sounding from Nashville is the closest one that we have to our forecast area. And you can see it's uh, the air, this area was kind of worked over from precipitation that occurred uh, in the evening before. So you have you know very weak lapse rates, a little bit of uh, instability, uh, almost very little to no shear in the to speak of. Uh, uh, but you do see some hints of some skinny cape, which would be favorable for heavy rain production later in the day. And indeed by about 18Z, uh, this is the, from the SPC mesoanalysis website, so it's based on the RAP uh, analysis. You kind of see over Western Kentucky by the time we get into the afternoon, you do have a pretty nice corridor of uh, <clears throat> uh, two to 3,000 mixed layer CAPE values that have developed uh, kind of ahead of this complex that's working its way into the area. So it, the environment's becoming increasingly unstable, although there's not much in the way of shear to speak of. So any sort of uh, propagations kind of and shear uh, for storm su uh, uh, support and intensification is kind of uh, being created on more of a mesoscale process instead of something more uh, synoptically forced. And uh, you have uh, precipitable water, value, water values that are very uh, near climatological maxima for this time of year, uh, 2 to 2.1 inches. Um, this can really uh, really enhance the rainfall rates, create warm rain processes, and uh, lead to some very intense rainfall uh, in a short period of time. Uh, <clears throat> so that's sort of, you know, the environment that you're you're dealing with. And you take all this information and uh, you, you have this, uh, this is the day one Weather Prediction Center uh, excessive rainfall. Look, you're seeing these messages more and more uh, by forecast offices. So you have a slight risk uh, basically along the Mississippi River into Western Kentucky and then down to the Tennessee Valley. So 
our mindset is um, we treat these slight risks for uh, excessive rainfall in a lot of the same ways that we would treat a uh, SPC slight risk or, or another uh, or a moderate risk. You know, uh, we, we definitely uh, gear our staffing in our office uh, to handle these sorts of situations because they can get just as busy as uh, severe weather events. So this is this is this is a this is what our mindset was in our office, and we definitely had extra people available and extra people uh, remotely uh, nowadays to, to help uh, keep an eye on things. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of decision support right now uh, related to COVID-19. So, you know, this really uh, increases the workload um, for our office, um, especially uh, when you have the potential for, you know, your regular severe duties and then your decision support services on top of it. So with that in mind, uh, at you know, the start of the day, we had a flash flood watch in effect for most of our forecast area. And, and this is, and I'm kind of hovering over, this is Western Kentucky here. This county that's gonna get affected, that I'll talk about in a little bit, it's, it's called Callaway County. It's the home of Murray, Kentucky. You might be familiar with Murray State University. It's located here. Our office is located here in Paducah. And then you have Southeast Missouri and uh, Southern Illinois. So, um, I'll kind of give you a regional radar loop to start things off with, with from 17 to 21Z. You can see this line of storms propagating to the south and east. And it seems to be moving at a pretty good clip. And you might ask yourself, well, how does this end in a you know uh, significant hydrologic event? Um, and, uh, and using the GOES app, the GOES data, we can kind of investigate that pretty thoroughly and uh, kind of show why what happened and, and what uh, led to that sort of intensification and, and, and rainfall rates that caused flash flooding. So uh, this is a uh, loop of uh, from the uh, invisible or visible satellite out of this complex from uh, 1939 to uh, 21Z that day. And what you can see here is the line, the complex of storms propagating to the south and east. You can actually see quite a bit of clearing ahead of this line. And so, you know, uh, I was working this day. I wasn't the hydrologic warning forecaster, but I was looking at radar and it became very apparent that the uh, environment ahead of this line was becoming increasingly unstable. And you could see the kind of uh, sort of bubbling cumulus development ahead of the line. And uh, I can uh, flip over to the, uh, here's the uh, five minute band loop from 18 to 20, uh, 24Z that same day. And uh, when I go to the one minute imagery, you're really gonna be able to see the sort of bubbling enhancement of the convection as it goes forward. And you can see a little bit of hints of these uh, very cold cloud tops bubbling up and then dissipating. And then um, <clears throat> flipping ahead to the one minute imagery here. And um, for some reason, I think the uh, I think the animation might be a little bit too much, much for the PowerPoint. Um, it's not catching everything, unfortunately. But um, on the one minute anim animation, you can really see these uh, bubbling um, <clears throat> cumulus towers go up and down. And right over here where I'm hovering my mouse, uh, that uh, uh, is Callaway County, Murray, Kentucky, where the flash flood event occurred. You can really see sort of a concentration of these overshooting tops and uh, <clears throat> rapidly cooling uh, cloud tops and enhanced rain that led to enhanced rainfall rates. And um, here's a 30 minute, <clears throat> Uh, from 19 to 1930Z, kind of rocking back and forth. It kind of gives you a really good look at uh, some of the development of these overshooting tops and uh, that you see, especially as this line propagates further into uh, far Southeast Missouri and into Western Kentucky. And uh, this is kind of a contrast. If you look up here uh, and across more of Southern Illinois, you actually see the cloud tops are either steady state or even warming a bit. And so it, this this animation kind of, you know, as a warning forecaster, I was drawn to this area because of the over, development of the overshooting tops and the and then the apparent warming of the cloud tops further north, which was kind of the area I was focusing on at first. And seeing these overshooting tops really led me to focus in on this more southerly region that was apparently uh, <clears throat> really starting to feel the uh, higher amounts of instability and from the uh, destabilization that occurred earlier in the day. So this was a really useful application of the one minute imagery and uh, this rocking imagery um, <clears throat> really. And this, and just to restate, you know, a lot of times you use, you see long loops 
of satellite imagery, but a lot of times in morning processes, maybe you know, I might only have a few images up and I'm looping them back and forth looking for short-term trends. And this is a really good uh, example of the, the application of that. So let's switch over to the uh, GLM flashes uh, from the 18 to 22 uh, UTC period. And I'll let this loop while I uh, talk over it. And you can sort of see it's, um, and I'll, we can quantify this later on, but you can sort of see a general uptick in the lightning data, especially as you go from the 19 to 20 Z period, and then a slow trend down once you uh, get past, especially the 2030 uh, Z uh, time period. But you can see that, and I'll hover over the Callaway County area again, the area that was affected. And <clears throat> you can see the upward trend and then this gradual downward trend in lightning information or lightning uh, flashes um, as we go through the time period. And, <clears throat> and thanks to uh, Scott and Dan for plotting this for me. And you can kind of see this over Southern Illinois, Western Kentucky, you can see this very uh, pronounced uptick um, you know, basically from uh, 1845 all the way up to about 1915, and then kind of a steady state going through much of the 19Z period into 20Z, and then a gradual uh, downward trend going into as we get after 21Z. So to me, as a warning forecaster, you know, who was looking at this at, at the time, you know, you saw the cooling cloud tops, you saw the uh, uptick in lightning data, and and then what you want to do is, uh, and here you can see the quantified. I'll go through that first. And this is the uh, GLM flash events from 18 to 19Z, and uh, you can see um, this this uptick going from 18 to 19Z of um, you know a total flashes of 6,687, and then stepping ahead to 19Z, you uh, see another an, uh, another increase from 19 to 20 of 8,000 flashes roughly. And uh, and that's, this is a nice way to be able to, to, to quantify that, what you're seeing kind of qualitatively um, going through all this. So you have the cooling cloud tops, you know, you notice the uptick in the GLM uh, lightning extent data. And then the next thing you're in your mind is, okay, what does this look like if you're interrogating the radar? So I was going to step out of this really quick and open, I have GR2 uh, analyst open. And I'll start this loop at, uh, starts at 1930. And you see this line of storms and I'm coming into Western Kentucky here and I'll step forward. And so I have the velocity, you know, reflectivity here on the top left, uh, velocity data, top right, uh, KDP uh, values on the bottom left and then the ZDR values on the bottom right. So um, stepping forward, you see, um, and what really stands out to me is this sort of increase as we get, especially into 20Z of, uh, of uh, these KDP values over two, and as you get into the Callaway County area, uh, especially, and then stretching into Tennessee, and the sort of expansion of the values that are greater than two. And sometimes when you're, especially in the, you know, the spring or the fall, you might see something like this, and you think, well, that's melting hail, or it's some sort of you know interference uh, from from uh, ice in the in the cloud, um, but in this case we know that the from the sounding the freezing level is about 14,000 feet. Your minus 20 level is about 26,000 feet. It's very you know hard to get you know significant ice production when you have such a, a warm uh, warm cloud layer, and so when you see things like this, you know to me that that set indicates that you're seeing very efficient very heavy rainfall rates and then kind of uh, going up in tilts and uh, you can kind of see over Callaway County too, uh, this these little areas of little ZDR columns with the stronger cells. And so that to me indicates you have some very strong updrafts. So I'll just uh, go back to my PowerPoint here. So, um, so what you have here and just kind of putting it all together, um, you know, the warning decision process, you kind of have your pre-event mesoanalysis, you know, you get yourself spun up with the environment. Um, and then as you're look, interrogating this, you know, the, the uh, GOES data, you notice the cloud tops that are cooling. You're seeing the uptick in uh, GLM flash data and flash counts. And then you're seeing a response in the radar presentation, especially with uh, things like the KDP expansion of the uh, values greater than two. 
And so you put all that together and that kind of gives you a bunch of confidence in your warning decision. So going forward, so we taking all this data, once we saw this, these heavy rain events uh, or heavy rain developing with this, the cool cloud tops, the GLM lightning um, uh, in data increasing, um, that led us to be very pretty confident as an office to issue a flash flood warning uh, as going into 2041 UTC on July 1st. So that um, um, was a you know very uh, good good decision in general. And then uh, something else that we could do uh, using the ghost data is a uh, you know partner messaging. So this is an excerpt from NWS chat, and you can see the flash flood warning was issued at 2041. And then it takes me a minute or two to type up the message. But what you're seeing here is you're seeing, you know, intense thunderstorm development over Callaway County. Uh, at the time, the cloud tops got up to about minus 80 and uh, degrees C. And uh, and so putting all together, we were expecting vigorous rainfall rates creating flash flood problems. And it didn't take long uh, afterwards to start seeing reports rolling in from from our emergency management media partner. So this is a gauge from the Kentucky Mesonet um, that's located right in central Callaway County. And uh, you can see, uh, you're seeing a response from about you know, a quarter inch of rain to a little over two and a half inches of rain. And that fell basically in about you know 30 to 45 minutes. And so you're seeing rates of three to four inches per hour uh, for a very short period of time. But you know, there are very few places, especially in an urban environment that can handle that kind of rain without having some significant flash flood issues. So um, now I'm gonna show just a response from the um, MRMS um, flash, which is something that we use a lot in uh, hydrologic uh, warning decisions. And so I'll just, um, I'll put my cursor here over Callaway County. So at 2030 UTC, just as you're seeing the thunderstorms develop over the Callaway County area, you're not seeing much in a response of, um, sorry, response in the flash flood guidance from the uh, uh, QPE, the qualitative precip <clears throat> precipitation estimates to the flash flood guidance ratio for one hour. And then by the, the warning was issued at uh, 2041Z, and then stepping ahead to 21 UTC, all of a sudden you see a large swath of, you know, point, you know, point eight, uh, to one or, or greater values of the flash flood guidance being exceeded. So you're, it's it's this is indicating a very tremendous response to these rainfall rates and uh, having that gauge data, having the radar data, and then having that satellite data kind of uh, really, the ghost data really let you sort of anticipate the response that you're going to see on radar from the cooling cloud tops and the increase in GLM uh, activity. So, uh, just to show you a little bit of the impacts, uh, the, I have a couple of pictures. This was uh, some flash flooding in the city of Murray in uh, in Callaway County. Um, so you see, you know, quite a bit of water on the street with cars um, probably taking on some water damage. Um, there were uh, two or three water rescues that we're aware of. This was one of them, and um, this was a um, more out in the country. And there was another. Um, water rescue that occurred in the southern part of the county as well. And thankfully no one was no one was injured or anything like that, but um, seeing this, uh, we were able to use this data. And then uh, and just about half an hour later after we issued the initial warning, we upgraded the flash flood warning to a considerable tag, which uh, if you're familiar with how the uh, WEA alerts uh, function now, um, you know, a base flash flood warning doesn't activate the WEA on your phone but the uh, up upgrade to a considerable or catastrophic tag that will activate the WEA alert or the WEA on your phone to uh, alert you of the flash flood warning. Uh, so that was, um, you know, very timely warnings. You know, we were able to get, you know, very, I was, you know, I think we were as an awesome office, we're very pleased with the lead time considering that sometimes these events can kind of pop up very quickly and uh, either you're late with the warning or you're, there's no lead time at all. And this time, in this case, we were able to get the flash flood warning out about 15 minutes ahead of the impacts uh, beginning to really uh, become a uh, <clears throat> widespread. So I thought I'd just use or end uh, with this loop, or this is a screenshot I just took uh, about an hour ago of uh, kind of a setup that I, I was using that day. Um, and, you know, basically MRMS reflectivity, uh, you know, your goes, I had the visible and uh, 
the, the clean IR here on the top right, your GLM flash extent density here on the bottom right, and then your uh, cloud pul pulses, cloud flashes, and then lightning strikes. And this uh, is something I keep up pretty much all the time now uh, when I'm doing anything uh, operationally with radar, and it's a very popular procedure that we have in our office that lets you anticipate with the cooling cloud tops and the lightning data, especially GLM, that you're seeing some really uh, quick anticipation, especially rainfall rates, and using that data combined with the mesoanalysis data that you kind of looked at beforehand, and then combine that with your knowledge of, the, of your county warning area, especially vulnerable urban areas, areas that are vulnerable to uh, low water uh, crossings, especially that's something that's a big concern of ours. Um, that flood often and that can cause some some big issues um, and hilly terrain that sort of thing as well um, those are all areas that we're you know especially focused on so um, the ghost data has really been kind of a game changer for us as an office um, <clears throat> to really anticipate these sort of enhanced rainfall rates combined with the mesoanalysis data that you've already used uh, to do uh, short fuse hydrologic warning decisions so with that um, thank you for the opportunity to present a little bit of what, what we're doing here in Paducah, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, I just wanted to point out in the chat, I have noted that the PowerPoint that you are showing will be available after this talk, so you, people can download that and they'll see the full res animations, because sometimes with like home internet, it's very hard to, for me, for example, it's very hard to see a good animation of one minute imagery. Um, but if anyone has any questions, um, I see one in the chat. Were you able to identify any boundaries in the pre-storm environment that would have slowed or focused the convection? Do you remember? Uh, not, not particularly at the time. As I will say that as the the storms, especially further to the north of where the flash flooding occurred, became more outflow dominant, and you started to see outflow boundaries up there. But that was more of a sign of the the convection weakening. Uh, so there really, I, there really wasn't anything that really stood out in terms of a focus for uh, the intensification in terms of like boundaries and things like that. Although we do see that quite often with other events, um, we'll see outflow boundaries, you know, lead to localized intensification all the time or or uh, even severe wind gusts or a uh, quick spin up tornadoes. Uh, that's all happened in the last month or so <laughs> here. So <laughs> it's uh, uh, this time it, 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 it really didn't stand out, but uh, the, I will say that the, the GLM and the cloud top temperatures really were, were what keyed us in on, on this. And, and it's easy as a warning forecaster, you know, you have the flash flood watch out and then, but you're kind of looking at the radar too. And you're like, well, this line's moving, is it's pretty progressive. And you know you're not, you know you're trying to figure out okay maybe there might be some, um, you know localized flooding and um, here and there, but you know you might not get anything that would be really you might not get rates that would really uh, <clears throat> cause you know big widespread issues. So uh, and this was really something that lets you key on the areas you really need to focus on. Does anyone else have any questions before I keep asking? Because I'm curious. <laughs> just, uh, you should be unmuted. Just start talking. Or m make sure you're unmuted and start talking. I, I see a question here from, from Brian about the uh, pre-event soil flash flood or soil moisture. Um, yeah, that was definitely a factor. Um, uh, maybe not specifically in that county, but the, the day before we'd actually had a WPC moderate risk of excessive rainfall, and there had been heavier rainfall to the north and to the west uh, in southeast Missouri and southwest Illinois that had definitely been uh, produced quite a bit of rain and some flash flooding. And so we, I would, the, the pump was primed, so to speak, for for issues. So our guard was definitely up. Uh, we weren't really sure how much it would have an issue it would be um, <clears throat> with the progressive nature of the, of the storms. Uh, we were, you know, definitely our eyes were, con you know, we were focused on some of the more urbanized areas and our CWA is pretty rural, but we do have some small cities that, that can definitely have some issues when, uh, when things come together in the right way. Do you, does, does anyone in your office look at the uh, derived rain rate product that comes out of GOES-16? 
driver. I don't believe so. I I, I don't look at it uh, a lot. Um, is it, if, if you want to talk about it a little bit, I, you know, please. Uh, no, I, 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 as you were, I mean, I had some email about that today for creating some training on it. And I was thinking, I wonder what it looked like for this particular event because I didn't look at it. Um, so I'm just curious if that's something that you look at in the office, but if not, um, maybe you can look at it today and see if it's and see if it could be helpful. Yeah, we already have, I see we have three flash flood warnings out right now. So uh, definitely kind of a, a busy, it, it doesn't seem like a busy day this morning, I'll say that. And then it seems like it's kind of ramped up during the day, which happens, you know, occasionally. <laughs> and I see another question. Do you use the flash stream flow output at all for decision making? Yes, we, we use flash quite a bit. I, I personally use flash a lot. Um, it's I, I use it and FFMP together, um, depending on the uh, topography, uh, sometimes FFMP can be a little bit better at at, um, <clears throat> at looking at, uh, especially in some of the hillier terrain, picking up those really small basins that uh, can flood easily. Um, in the Ozark areas in our, of our far western part of our county warning area, that can be, um, <clears throat> th that can be particularly useful, both uh, the flash uh, MR or the flash and the FFMP uh, stream flow uh, information, but yes, uh, I do have it up. One limitation to the the, the stream flow data is uh, it can sometimes it, it's kind of slow to update. It's every 10 minutes, and sometimes you're looking at kind of a snapshot, you know, of something maybe 10 or 15 minutes ago, which may not be a huge uh, issue uh, sometimes. But with, during the in a situation like the one we went through, where you basically went from, you know, you have three you know three to four inch per hour rainfall rate so I can it can kind of be slow to catch up and I guess I'll ask a question about this is your southernmost county was it something happening in the Memphis forecast at the same time that you were had having to coordinate with them um I'm trying to remember if I, I believe I want to say Memphis issued a flash flood warning against us in the uh, in their northwest Tennessee counties, um, or some or a flood advisory that one of those two. So I think uh, we we will. I, I definitely I think we passed along to them that we'd had reports of you know flash flooding. Uh, I, I believe actually there was flash flooding all the way down to the state line uh, with Tennessee, where were they we hand off things to them. So. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not ex exactly sure what product they issued, but we were, I, I do remember collaborating with them uh, about the impacts that we were seeing from this. Are there any other, if anyone else listening in wants to ask a question, unmute yourself and ask the question now, please. I don't hear anything, so I will uh, thank Derek again. Um, Scott, I see a question from Brian regarding prop severe. Okay. Me... Brian, cool. you can ask a question if you'd like to speak up. Oh, I, I see it here about using prop severe. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, we look, I look at prob severe a lot. Um, I don't believe we were in the, I didn't show it, but we did have the SPC did have us in a marginal risk of severe weather. Um, the lapse rates were just kind of a limiting factor. And so you, you in this kind of situation, you might have it, you know, I remember there being quite a few areas where it was highlighting, you know, maybe a 10 to 20% area, maybe some severe winds um, at the time, um, but nothing that would really jump out at you. Um, in terms of, you know, oh, I need to issue a severe thunderstorm warning right now sort of thing. So that was, uh, but it's definitely something that that we look at a lot as an office um, when um, we're interrogating radar. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, I see that it's 1.30, so we spent a half hour with Derek. Derek, thank you very much. Oh, um, you're welcome. Another FDTD webinar is in the works, and you'll see uh, email about that at some point in the future. Thank you.